Hello and welcome to the procedural session on obstetric emergencies. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. And I'm joined by Dr. Drew Kauna, who serves as one of our Associate Medical Directors for Outreach Education. Drew, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm also joined by Dan Ellinger, who is our EMS Coordinator at Doctors Hospital, as well as Hilliard Freestanding Emergency Department. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Eric. So, the goal of this session is to focus on a precipitous delivery that you as an EMS provider could be called on. Our patient is here, we're on scene, and uh, the patient's saying that she is in labor. Dr. Kelno is gonna walk us through an approach to the precipitous delivery. So Drew, we're on scene, you've said hi to the patient, uh, what do you do? Yeah, so first things first, this isn't really an emergency. <laughs> All right, so this is a natural process that we think of as EMS providers, as emergency medicine providers, as an emergency, because it's not something we do very often. This is totally natural, right? So the vast majority of deliveries, even if it's precipitous delivery in the field, are gonna go just fine. Mm -hmm. But just like we talked about with other procedures, the key is preparing for all the things that can go wrong so that if that does happen, we're ready to intervene. Plus, since we don't do it very often, I mean, maybe one of the most rare things we do, being familiar with our equipment and everything else is really important. So. First step on this is actually watching this video and doing some training with your department. Make sure you know where your OB kit is. It's gonna be a kit that looks something like this. I got the equipment out here all spread out. We'll talk about it as we go through some of the steps. Um, oftentimes it's hidden under a bench seat or in the back of a compartment with some dust on top of it because it hasn't been used recently. <laughs> but training with this and knowing where your, your equipment is and knowing what's in the box is gonna really carry you forward. Once you actually get to the patient, there's some basic things we need to know. So, How's mom doing, right? Because mom's really the key to this. So mom, we wanna make sure she's awake, she's alert, she's talking to us, and she can give us a good history. How many times have you been pregnant? And how many times have you given birth? So those are our G's and our P's, so gravita and para. Gravita is the number of pregnancies, para is the number of deliveries. So if this is a first pregnancy, you're gonna be a G1, P0, right? You're pregnant, but you haven't delivered yet. And then those numbers go up depending on how many pregnancies, how many deliveries. There's more numbers at the end of that, that our OB colleagues really care about right. for the purposes of this, G's and P's G are all we P. care about. <laughs> the reason why we really care about G's and P's is because the more P's there are, the more rapid we can expect this delivery to progress, right? The mom's physio physiology uh, is just more prepared to deliver. It's been through this before, so she's gonna be uh, more adept at uh, a speedy delivery most likely. Sure, G's and P's and then I always just ask about what were your previous pregnancies like? What were the previous deliveries like? If there were complications, that should make you a little bit more concerned. If there were all previous C-sections, that should make you a little bit more concerned as well. So just a general description of what was it like in the past can be very beneficial and give you a lot of good knowledge, I think, too. Sure, have you had to have surgery, a C-section before? Uh, was that planned or was that emergent where right. there was a complication during delivery? Things like that. And then have you gotten OB care? So what's your care been like? Were there any concerns by the OB prior to going into your delivery that we need to know about? Uh, do we know if the baby's positioned appropriately? Are they head down or are they still breech where the, the bum is down and the head's up uh, where we know that that might be, might be an issue? So certainly if we know that's a problem, we're gonna prepare for it. We're gonna prepare for it regardless, but, but those are definitely some of the other questions we wanna know about. And having those questions in the back of your mind, practice them intermittently just so that you know what to ask right away. What about physical exam? Um, what are you looking for? So how far along is this patient? You, you know, what are you, what are you looking for that's a brief, quick, concise physical exam? Yeah, so the, the quick hit in figuring out how far along a, a female is, particularly if they don't know their date specifically, is identifying where the fundus is. So the fundus is really the top of the uterus, and that's where you can see, like, feel as you're palpating the abdomen, okay, hey, here's where the baby is, here's where the uterus is. So if they're full term and they're getting ready to deliver, we expect the fundus to be almost up towards that xiphoid process, the bottom of your sternum, um, and certainly above your umbilicus, your belly button. If the fundus is at the belly button, that's about 20 weeks in, so mm -hmm. roughly halfway through your pregnancy. And if you can feel the fundus above the pubic symphysis, then we know that we're, we're really towards the end of that first trimester, we're 10 plus weeks 
into the pregnancy at that point. So that's kind of the quick and dirty. We're expecting on a precipitous delivery that's going to uh, deliver a healthy baby that it, you know, we're essentially term is that fundus is going to be much closer to the xiphoid process, the bottom of the sternum, at least above the umbilicus. If it's lower, that's certainly concerning for a, a premature birth, and that just should heighten our concern for both complications with mom post-delivery, mm -hmm. but also complications as the baby comes out. And, and as far as the resuscitation, we might need to do on the baby. Lots of good info there. The closer you are to the chest, basically, the further along you are. If we're in labor and we're far away from that chest, then you should be alert for complications, mom and baby. And then at the belly button or the, uh, is when you start thinking about the age of viability of the baby, yeah. where uh, that changes really what you do after the delivery occurs as well. Yeah. Now the caveat to that is if mom is in active labor, really as long as we feel something at the umbilicus or above, we're happy because that baby's now dropping into the pelvis a little farther down than they would be pre-labor. Mm -hmm. So don't necessarily expect it to be way up high. So I, the caveat is, you know, really if you can feel the fundus and it's near the belly button, then hopefully we're gonna be okay on somebody who's in active labor because that baby's dropping down from where they would be maybe a week or two earlier prior to labor starting. So this patient is saying that she's in labor. She's having contractions and her water broke. What does that mean when the water breaks and when do you get concerned about contractions? Yeah, so, so water is, is really the fluid surrounding uh, the baby in this situation. And so that's your you know, placenta and, and all the fluid that's, that's in there is, is ruptured. And so now uh, the body's really preparing for delivery. Mom's giving the baby everything it needs through the, the, the umbilicus, the, uh, the cord and the baby's really working its way out because what we know is the baby plus everything that goes into it, the placenta and the uterus and all that has to change as it's coming out. It can't all fit out uh, in one clear package. So that breaking of the placenta and the water, uh, water breaking is what we're actually talking about. So that's really that last step before we get into what we consider full on labor and eminent delivery. Now, if we talk to our OB colleagues, there's steps before that, but we, of course. we don't care about that. <laughs> what we care about is once that water breaks, something's coming next. Basically, do we have time to get the patient to the hospital or do we need to deliver either on scene or in the truck? Yeah, and water breaking itself doesn't tell us we're gonna deliver in the back of the truck on the way to the hospital or we're gonna deliver in the hospital. There's more to it than that, right? right? We, this is, if the water breaks, even if the water hasn't broken, we need to check anyway. So if mom says, I think I'm in labor, I'm full term, I'm getting close to my due date, our job in this situation is to get mom undressed, right? And we're gonna need to do just a visual exam mm -hmm. and say, is there a baby coming or not? Because what we really don't wanna do is we don't want a baby to deliver without our help, right? That's just, uh, that's bad. So a key step in making that decision about can we get to the hospital or do we need to prepare for delivery is you really gotta do a visual inspection. Yep. and determine if there's a presenting part. Absolutely. Right? Um, so this patient, uh, her contractions are very frequent. Uh, her water has broken and you do a visual inspection and uh, there's a presenting part. Can you walk us through the steps of how you're going to approach this and uh, perform the delivery? Yeah, so first of all, I wanna figure out what is that presenting part and I am hoping, two fingers crossed, that I see hair. <laughs> yeah. Right, because if I see here, then I know the head is coming down and that's the position that we want the baby in. But our job in this situation is so we're going to have gloves on and, and if we're worried about a, a, a presenting part, if we don't have our OB kit open, it needs to be sitting out next to us ready to go, right? So in the OB kit actually is sterile gloves. Ideally we put those on, but I don't know that that really matters at the end of the day, right? Just have gloves on, and you're probably gonna want a gown on also if you have one in the back of the truck, because this could get messy, mm -hmm. particularly if the water that has broken has not completely evacuated uh, for a mom, or if there's bleeding and there's other things going on. I, I will tell you, I've been a part of this both in the back of a medic before, and as well as in the emergency department, and uh, I'm never clean afterwards. Yeah. So prepping yourself a little bit for it. So next thing is we wanna get mom in what we call the lithotomy position. So here we have a hospital bed with these stirrups. I, these don't come uh, equipped on most medics. <laughs> so um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna scoop mom down farther towards the end of the cot um, and you're gonna have mom's just legs up, you know, as, as close to her bum as she can in that kind of frog leg like position. This does a couple of things. One, it gives us access to check the baby, but it also puts mom's hips 
and pelvis in the most ideal position to start delivering that baby to open things up uh, so that the baby can come out with the least amount of resistance right. and the least, least amount of trouble for mom. Um, you know, another trick of the trade is if you have a little bed pan in the back of your truck, and again, those might be hidden under some dust and some tiles next to the OB kit, you can slide that under mom's hips and that gives her a little more uh, uh, lift of the hips and allows her to bring those legs back and up a little bit. It, it recreates this position that we're in right now. Optimizing the position, it's key to a lot of procedures that we do in EMS. All right, now what? So now we actually need to look, right? <laughs> so uh, the part that, that is just what it is, we gotta look. So keep mom as modest and covered as we can and we don't need to really be aggressive in looking, right? It's simply taking a look at the, the vaginal space, the vaginal walls, and is anything coming out? So do I see some hair? Do I see a smooth, rounded crown? Or do I see something that looks like an elbow, looks like a foot, looks like a hand? Or do I see a cord, right? So these are all the things I need to know. Is, is the baby breech? Uh, are we gonna have a hand first delivery where we're gonna be worried about shoulders getting stuck? Or are we gonna have a, uh, a cord delivery where now all of a sudden we have to be very careful about making sure there's not pressure on the cord so that the baby survives through delivery uh, as well as possible and, and, and successfully. So before we do a normal delivery, let's talk about those complications that you can see when you take a look. You mentioned you see a cord. So yeah. what does that mean if you look and there's the cord that's there? What yeah. do you do? So prolapse cord in this situation is what we're talking about. And, and this is where the umbilical cord is presenting before the baby actually presents. And what we worry about in this situation is that the pressure from the delivery is the head and the shoulders are coming out that we put so much pressure on the umbilical cord that we essentially stop blood flow from mom to the baby. And remember, until baby comes all the way out, or at least the thorax is out and we squeeze that meconium and, and whatever maybe is in the lungs out, the baby hasn't gone through the physiology of taking its first breath, so it's depending on mom for oxygenation. And if we cut that off, that's essentially strangulating mm -hmm. the baby. So what we need to do in that situation is reduce the pressure on the cord as much as absolutely possible. And that's gonna be by keeping the head up, keeping any presenting part lifted off the cord so that the cord is, is having the least amount of constriction or strangulation on it. Now what if you look and there's a foot or the baby's bottom that's being presented? Yeah, then we just need to get the hospital really fast. <laughs> Um, so in that situation, we're going to do a couple things. One, we're, we're going to prepare ourselves and we're also going to alert the hospital in advance as soon as possible that we are uh, experiencing a breach delivery, right? So, and this is a situation where getting to the hospital is going to be beneficial for the patient, both patients that are about, that we're about to have, but we might have to deal with it in the back of the truck or in the house anyway. And so we're going to work with mom in this situation. We're gonna maybe increase that lithotomy position, try to open the pelvis up as much as possible. We're also, if we think we can get to the hospital, we're gonna discourage mom from pushing, right? So we're gonna to try to prolong this delivery and this labor process a little bit, as opposed to if the baby's coming out and there's nothing we can do and we see ahead, you know, just go ahead and push because we're ready to go. Uh, we're not gonna push the baby back up and try to turn it around. Uh, we're gonna deal with whatever presents to us, but we're gonna try to slow things down a little bit and see if we can't get to that expert care. And if we can't, then we're gonna talk about some things that we can do as the delivery process goes. Sure. And um, in some of these scenarios, in the hospital setting, the fetal heart rate will be monitored. And specifically, they're looking for decelerations or fetal bradycardia, basically. Um, we obviously don't have that ability to monitor the baby like that in the pre-hospital setting. Is there any role for fetal heart tones in these scenarios to help inform us about what to do? You know, in eminent delivery, I don't know that, that measuring fetal heart tones matters that much. Certainly if mom says I'm having some contractions, I'm having some belly pain, she's having other complaints but isn't actively in labor with presenting parts, then trying to get a fetal heart rate um, isn't gonna hurt anything. And, and oftentimes trucks have the ability to get a Doppler pulse or you can try to listen for a fetal heart rate. Asking mom, hey, where's the last place that OB heard a good fetal heart rate is important. The, the other part of that is that make sure we're monitoring mom's pulse also, because if what you think is the fetal heart rate matches exactly what mom's heart rate is, I, I'm pretty sure it's mom's heart rate. In that situation that you're listening to or that you're hearing, um, the, the baby's heart rate should be a fair amount higher, like right. 140s to 180s, 130s to 180s. So uh, in the heat of the moment, the baby's coming out, I think there's a lot of things to worry about. Worrying about getting a fetal heart rate isn't gonna change right. uh, what happens. But if we're not having an imminent delivery, then trying to hear a fetal heart rate is not gonna hurt anything and might be of some benefit for the hospital receiving the patient. And you bring up a good point about there's probably a lot of focus on the delivery 
and being in labor, but having one of your partners or one of your colleagues focusing on mom at the head of the bed or talking to mom is going to be extremely important too. Um, one more complication I want to just touch on briefly is you know the shoulder dystocia. Basically, you know the baby is getting stuck. It's you know the shoulders can't pass out through the opening. What are some techniques that we can use to help overcome shoulder dystocia? Yeah, for shoulder dystocia, really the, the number one technique that we're going to use in the back of a medic or in somebody's house if we're having imminent delivery outside of a hospital is knees to chest. And this is going to be the same thing in a breech delivery if the baby's not progressing really well. And so when we say knees to chest, what we're doing is we're truly trying to open and flatten that pelvis as Literally, much as we possibly can. Literally knees to chest, right? Knees to chest. And so it might be a partner on each side holding the knees up, or if we don't have enough manpower, it's going to be asking mom to give herself essentially a hug at the knees and bring them up. And what that does is it widens your pubic symphysis, it widens your pelvic uh, rami and the wings of your pelvis to open that up as much as possible and maximize the amount of space so hopefully that shoulder can then come out. You know, the other thing we can do is we're guiding, and, and we'll show this technique a little bit as best we can uh, during the delivery process itself, but we can kind of lift the shoulder a little bit, guide the shoulder. The last ditch thing that we would do, and we talk about this in the emergency department and, and paramedics hear about this as they're training, is if you can't get the baby out, you can break the clavicle. Now, certainly that's not something I wanna do, that's not something I really want any of our providers to have to do, but if it's a question of life or death for the baby, mm -hmm. that's something to consider, just to know that, that that is a thing. I would call the hospital in advance and, and yeah. get some medical control and direction before proceeding on to something like that. Some folks advocate for some mild suprapubic pressure as well. And then as a drastic measure, you can actually put the patient on all fours, and that can change some of the dimensions and help the baby uh, progress uh, out as well. Um, but this is going to be the most, uh, the most successful technique is, is the hyperflexion or knee to chest as well. So those are some of the complications, and you always don't want to see those things. And most of the time, you're not going to see those things, and you'll have to just facilitate the normal birthing process. So let's assume that, again, this is our patient in labor, it's a precipitous delivery, and you gotta deliver on scene. Um, you're seeing the presenting part, it's a head. Walk us through the steps of how you're gonna help deliver this baby. Uh, so now we're gonna have all our equipment laid out, and so talking about equipment real quick is gonna be important. So if we're gonna deliver, there's not a whole lot of things we need, but we do need a couple things. So um, we want our cord clamps, so we should have two of these in the OB kit, and so we'll talk about using the cord clamp once the baby comes out. Something to cut the cord. Sometimes you have fancy scissors like this. Sometimes it's just a scalpel in the OB kit. Either of those is fine. Bulb suction syringe. This is to suction the mouth and the nose out if there is a bunch of fluid or meconium or something along those lines. There's going to be a lot of things like 4 by 4s towels of various forms, um, a, a set of sterile gloves. Again, not necessary, but if you have time to put them on, it's not going to hurt anything. And then we're going to grab a couple extra towels too. One, just some towels on the floor of wherever we're delivering in the back of the truck is uh, going to help uh, to catch whatever fluids and things come out. But we need something to put the baby in right away also. So if the OB kit doesn't have a blanket and a hat on it, getting a couple towels, to dry the baby off, to stimulate the baby, and then wrap the baby and get the baby warm is gonna be really important. So this is where opening that kit, laying it out, and having everything ready to go is gonna be important. And certainly if you have a gown or, or something to protect yourself with and you have time to do that, that's not a bad idea either. Mm -hmm. All right, so as the head starts coming out, there's really only a couple things that we need to do as providers if things go really well. So uh, number one is kind of supporting the head and just kind of opening things up. So with our gloved hands, baby head is coming out and each time mom's having a contraction that head's coming a little bit farther out or a little bit closer we want to do a sweep so we're going to sweep with our finger around and as we're doing this we're doing a couple things we're opening up the vaginal space helping stretch things out a little bit we're going to provide a little bit of lift to the head itself to keep the head off the floor of the pelvis but we're also checking to see do we feel a, a cord do we have the umbilical cord and are we worried about uh, a nuchal cord wrapped around the neck or are we worried about that that presentation of the cord too mm -hmm. soon and this will help us identify that and lift any pressure out of it so as the baby starts coming out we're just going to continue to do our sweep and the baby's going to keep coming and as the baby head comes out more and more we're going to provide some lift to the head so we don't want that head just flopping down if the baby's face is down what we're going to do is we're essentially going to use one of our hands to lift that head up and the neck up keeping the mouth and the nose clear of, of any suffocation and then as the baby comes out hopefully it's just going to come out nicely. We're not pulling. We're just continuing to sweep, feeling for anything coming out. 
And eventually, the tightest part is going to be those shoulders. And we're going to help kind of move that vaginal wall around the shoulders. Once we get past the shoulders, that baby should just present itself really easily. Watch out, we got a slippery kid. All right. <laughs> so the first thing you want to do now, we're going to have a full uh, umbilical cord attached to the kid at this point, is we're going to put this on mom in some towels. All right. So we got a nice towel here. We're going to get the baby kind of dried off, doing a lot better. We're going to get clamps. So we're going to clamp a couple inches away from the baby itself. And then we're going to clamp again closer to mom, not all the way at mom. So our two clamps, and then we're going to get that cord cut off. All right. So we're going to leave plenty of stump for the kid. There's, there's reasons for this. One, if we need vascular access for the kid, it's available to us. Um, also, you know, there's other things the hospital might need that cord for. And if we get too close, then it can cause some infection issues down the road. Once the baby's out, dried off, part of the drying process is getting that baby stimulated, mm -hmm. right? Because we want baby to get stimulated. We want baby to start crying, to start breathing, oftentimes not going to be breathing or crying right away upon delivery. So that drying off provides that stimulation that, that baby needs. And then putting it on mom's belly and mom's chest, lots of heat coming off of mom. She just went through a really active thing. So she's very warm. We want to make sure we keep that baby warm too. But now we got two patients. So we got to take care of two patients because we're not done yet. Right. Right, so the two things we have to worry about in this situation is making sure baby's doing okay, that if we need to suction baby out, we get mouth suction, nose suction, that we check our APGARs and we make sure baby's breathing and baby's pulse is okay. But we also have to pay attention to mom because there's still a placenta that's gonna deliver. If there's tears to the, uh, the vaginal wall, the, the vagina at all, then there could be some bleeding that we have to take care of. Um, and we wanna make sure we don't lose the uh, umbilical cord all the way back up into mom because in this situation, as she delivers that placenta, that's something that either we are gonna do in the, the field or once they get to the hospital, help deliver that placenta and having that, uh, that cord is gonna help with the process. Right. Going back to the uh, cutting of the cord, some folks advocate waiting 30 seconds to decrease the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Is that something you employ? And is that really that important in the pre-hospital setting? Let me tell you, you're not going to get the cord cut in the first 30 seconds, right? <laughs> By the time you get the clamps on the baby, the baby's all the way out, you were doing a little uh, shaking and you find the scissors, plus with your hand shaking and the nerves going on in this situation, I have a hard time believing that we're going to be cutting the cord in under 30 seconds. So. Don't worry about it. So you're just going to delay just because of everything that you're everything doing. Everything else so is going on. It's probably important, but don't worry about it because it's going to happen anyway, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So of all the things to remember from this, that's not the thing I'd worry about because unless you're a speed demon, 30 seconds isn't an doesn't issue. Doesn't matter. Looking out for mom, the postpartum hemorrhage, keeping track of the cord, all important. Somebody talking to her, getting baby on mom, that is all very important. Let's say that we encounter the scenario, unfortunately, where mom is okay but we deliver the baby and uh, we're able to deliver the baby fine. Uh, how do we know if the baby's doing fine after we deliver? Yeah, so the first thing that we're looking for, if we hear a good cry and we have some movement and the, the baby's nice and pink, then we're happy, right? That's, that's the essence of what we're going for. We do use a score called the APGAR score mm -hmm. right now. So the APGAR score is gonna help us figure out how healthy the baby is. We wanna do this at roughly the two to three minute mark after delivery to get a good sense of is there any resuscitation that we need to be doing for the baby, do we need to be worried? So APGAR score is appearance, it's pulse, it's grimace, um, it's amount of activity and it's respiration. So there's going to be a scoring chart in any EMS guidebook to actually score that, but essentially a low APGAR is concerning. Right. The other thing we need to do is we need to take the baby's vitals. And the only two vitals we're going to get on a baby is we're going to get a respiratory rate and we're going to get a pulse. And this is another thing that the, uh, the umbilical stump is really good for. That's still going to have a very palpable pulse. So we're gonna check the pulse at the, the umbilical stump, and we wanna feel a pulse of at least 100 beats per minute. Under 100 beats per minute essentially is bradycardia for a, a baby, a newborn, and that's concerning to us. The first step in bradycardia actually is not compressions or medications. The first step is more stimulation and providing some breaths and oxygen to the patient, because oftentimes bradycardia in a newborn is stimulated by some apnea or decreased respiratory drive. So that's the thing that we're going to go to. We're going to suction that kid again. We might get our bag valve mask out and provide some blow-by respirations, just get a nasal cannula rocking and rolling near the baby's face and, and get that extra oxygen. And oftentimes, that's enough to stimulate the baby into a better APGAR and a stronger pulse down the road. But we're going to keep a really close eye on this because if that pulse doesn't get better or it drops further, now we have to actually think about doing CPR on a baby despite having a pulse. 
Some really good points there. Key is to remember, if not responding, inadequate respirations, or you know, think about 100, that's the bradycardia cutoff for a newborn, then we start thinking about uh, providing ventilatory support. The, the other thing to remember, too, is the pulse ox is not going to be normal in the newborn, and you're going to have lower levels. And it's much more accurate to look at respiratory rate, overall responsiveness, and then the heart rate, just like Dr. Kellner pointed out. So let's say that we encounter this baby, and uh, there was some, some initial bradycardia in and out of respirators, and we uh, started bag valve masking the newborn, and that heart rate continues to drop, and now we, we're down to 60 or 50. Yeah. So once you hit 60, despite your resuscitative efforts, or if any time you're below 60, that's actually CPR. So in a newborn, you might as well consider less than 60 beats per minute. This is a cardiac arrest equivalent. So we're gonna do compression. So we're just gonna start compressing the chest on the baby, right? And we're gonna start providing really regular bag valve mask respirations. We're also gonna consider now, do we need to intubate the baby? And do we need to provide a medication? This is where using the umbilical stump as vascular access might become a thing. And that's getting to, to be a pretty advanced thing, and, and that can be a, a separate talk for a different day. But epinephrine, um, that can go down the tube also in these newborns as well if, once you get intubation. So these are patients less than 60 beats per minute is really concerning. We need to be very aggressive in resuscitating them, including CPR. And, the, and another key difference with CPR, and it's different than PELS, for the neonate, uh, they advocate you know, three compressions to one ventilation, which is extremely different than that 15 to two ratio that we often see. So uh, good compressions and then three to one ratio. And it's hard to remember that, but uh, these are mainly breathing problems, Absolutely. You know, ra rather than there being some heart dysrhythmia. So focusing in on getting respirations is important. So we start compressions, we start ventilating, whatever means. Do we give drugs yeah, So or when? You know, I would do uh, two minutes of CPR for this patient if we haven't had progress and we're not improving as far as our oxygenation goes, our color goes, and our pulse goes. Now we need to consider intubating the patient and giving epinephrine uh, based on the, the, the newborn weight using your Braslow tape. The easiest route of access for this patient is to be epinephrine down an ET tube. Um, uh, if you are comfortable with and it's in your protocol to do umbilical vein catheterizations, then certainly that's access in that situation also. Oftentimes, though, that two minutes of CPR, good respirations, and oxygen is enough to resolve that situation. A lot of people are fine with IOs, too, but they're going to be challenging in the neonatal bone. Uh, and don't forget a little bit of fluid sometimes can be helpful, the small boluses, and check a blood sugar, too, to roll out hypoglycemia as, as, as a cause of the bradycardia and the instability also. Absolutely. I know there were some recent changes with uh, meconium. In, in the past, it was, you know, you would stick a tube down, suction, come out, and back and forth. What do you do with meconium standing now? So now we don't worry about meconium, essentially. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if there's a bunch of fluid in the mouth, we're going to suction it with the bulb suction, just like we would a bunch of fluid in the mouth, regardless, because we don't want that aspirated. Um, but uh, if the patient, again, is having respiratory or cardiac issues, that heart rate less than 100 or heart rate less than 60, that's when we get aggressive with RMA management and consider intubation. But otherwise, meconium staining is not that big of a deal, we're told now. And so we treat that just like a normal delivery. Yeah, so a few changes recently that are important to note with neonatal resuscitation. Uh, I think we've covered most of what we want. We had touched on the importance of history, the G's and P's, what's happened previously, what kind of care have you gotten. Basic physical exam things. Take a look if you're worried about precipitous delivery. Uh, utilize the fundal height to have an estimation about how far along your patient is. Uh, fetal heart tones can be okay to do, but they're not going to provide a whole bunch of useful information that's going to change what you do in these scenarios. Uh, when you take a look, look out for the things that are going to cause a bit more stress, the dystocias, uh, an umbilical cord presentation, a breech presentation, and have an idea in your mind about how you're going to try to manage those until you get to the hospital. The, uh, fa the facilitation of the birthing process, as Dr. Kalnell outlined, uh, it's good to have that in your head and uh, have it into your memory about what you're going to do. And then oftentimes you deliver the baby and it's this great feeling and then you got to remember, well, I've got two patients now and there's postpartum complications that can happen in mom and in baby that we need to be prepared to manage. So before that happens, think about getting help, notifying the hospital, 
and just having a good plan in place for that. Dr. Kelno, do you have anything else to add or in summary from a precipitous delivery standpoint? No, I think we covered it. You know, just like we talked about with all procedures, preparation is the key. And in this case, preparing is being comfortable with your equipment and just knowing the basic steps of the delivery process. If you know that, then the complications kind of fall into place and, and you'll learn how to troubleshoot those pretty quickly. But prepare, prepare, prepare. Preparation, that's great advice. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kelner. That was excellent. A lot of good tips for our EMS providers. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. For continuing education information, please visit our ohiohealthems.com site for all types of information, including ways to get CE for this event. Uh, happy EMS week. We, we appreciate you. Thank you for all that you do, and we look forward to hearing from you.